Well, I'm just really happy to have Jen Hager here, who's our, who's our Sutton Town Planner. And we're trying to keep this as formal as we can, informal as we can. But I'll let you uh, take it away and uh -huh. let us know if we can help you with anything. Perfect. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for all coming, everybody. Thank you for having me. As Clark said, I'm the Planning and Economic Development Director for the town. I've been with you um, just over 22 years. And um, gotten to know a lot about the town, a lot of people in the town. And uh, it's a great place. So um, I'm here today just kind of at your disposal. I'm going to, uh, the, the segment is kind of called What's Up? So I'm going to tell you a few things that are going on in the world of planning, share some stuff with you. And then I'm happy to kind of answer any questions you have, give you the skinny on things that I might know about, <laughs> um, let you know if I don't know about certain things. Um, but I'm here basically at your disposal to answer any questions you think I might have some knowledge on. And for anybody who knows me, if I don't, I'll let you know that too. <laughs> so um, this is my domain that I work in every day. This is the, obviously the map of the town of Sutton. 34 square miles, about 21,000 plus acres. Um, and um, this is the zoning map for the town. Um, shows you all our different zoning districts. And um, as you can see, about 82% of the town is just a zone rural residential. Um, but there's a lot going on in those orange and red and yellow areas in particular. <laughs> so, um, and that's where I spend uh, most of my effort kind of working for the planning board. Besides working for the planning board, though, I actually spend more time um, working for the town administrator and peripherally for the Board of Selectmen on community projects. Um, uh, grant applications for infrastructure like water and sewer or parks, um, uh, doing studies like our housing needs study we did a few years ago, or our open space and recreation plan. So they're related to planning in some way, obviously, because you need infrastructure for development and housing and everything. Um, but they're not under the purview of the planning board. So when I work for the planning board, um, basically, I'm reviewing plans that come in for new neighborhoods or new developments, um, writing bylaws um, that the board or residents have asked for, um, and, um, and doing planning-related studies like the master plan and the open space plan. So, um, so I just wanted to kind of give you the background here. So this is our awesome town. Those are our zoning districts. And what's going on in, in some of the town um, that I have, uh, I won't say control over, because I never seem to have control over anything, but that I'm involved with. So we'll, we'll show you a few feel-good projects uh, first. Um, so, um, for those who were here last week, this is the Van Dyke Park project. So, this is a baby renovation of Van Dyke Park, just up at the corner. Um, so, we're working with Sutton Recreational Resources, which is just a neighborhood group that sprung out of the Unity Park project over on Boston Road in Wilkes. Just a neighborhood group that came together and they want to continue to work to rehab park and recreational spaces all over Sun. So they're focusing at first on the playgrounds, but we'll move to things like trails and the like as they kind of uh, expand out. Um, on this park, they're helping me, um, because I'm inundated with a few other projects, they're actually helping me with some of the actual grant writing and stuff and dealing with uh, vendors we have to deal with. Um, because this is a small project, as you know. Van Dyke Park is intended to just stay a pocket park, just that little tiny neighborhood park um, that gets uh, daily use from the kids playing basketball who are always down at the park um, and gets a little more use uh, when soccer and baseball season is in here. Where is Van Dyke Park? So Van Dyke Park, um, <laughs> Van Dyke Park is the Huff Road Park. So, um, As you come here. Right here, so it's right on the corner. So on the corner, on the corner. Yeah. On the corner. Yeah. So the soccer field is and the oh, baseball field. Right. Okay. Yeah. The playground. I'm thinking of the one down the other end of Manchester. No, nope, no, that one I'm talking about next. I'll okay. show you that one next. So this is the little baby park named after Jake mm -hmm. um, uh, Van Dyke, uh, right across from Harriet's Quabbin sign. So. <laughs> um, 
So again, this is just going to be a baby one. Uh, we'll have some new swings that have uh, handicap accessible swings like this. Um, have the, this cool two-person swing where an uh, adult, if you want, can sit on one side and a toddler on the other side. You swing together. And then a little baby typical toddler swing, like the little bucket swing that toddlers have. And you have this climbing structure. This is for ages basically 4 to 12. Um, uh, these are actually substantial size, they look like rocks and climbing ropes. And then we'll have another standard set of swings for kind of up to adult, you know, those larger swings. Um, during the public hearing process, we got some great input, and we are actually adding, uh, we're switching out this xylophone because these are kind of like little xylophones, these flowers, they have, they, they're musical. Um, we're switching out this to probably kind of a, a drum kind of thing. And we are actually adding a component for uh, kids who are over the age of 12. So uh, kind of like a, a small monkey bar, um, stretch of monkey bars. Basically, so kids over the age of 12 have something to occupy themselves if they're waiting to get into the basketball game or the like. We'll also be adding some benches um, and maybe a picnic table as well. Um, believe it or not... Um, believe it or not, with uh, prevailing wage and public bidding, that's over $100,000 for what I just described. Um, and um, we have a $25,000 match um, on the town meeting warrant to go with this branch. So we have to appropriate all the money, and then we apply for a grant for all the 25% of this. Actually, no, this one is a this one is a bigger match. I think we get a. Uh, uh, yeah, we got a slightly bigger match on this one, come to think of it. So we'll get a little bit more back on that. So that's one of our little baby feel-good projects. Um, I didn't have time to print it out, but I don't know if any of you have had time to go down to Church Street, um, down to um, Church Street to, to Orchard Apartments. If you get a chance to take a trip down there, I worked with John um, Slocum last year, and we did a creative placemaking grant, and there is now a quarter-mile walking trail. It's open to anybody. goes around the whole facility, and there are little community planting beds along the way. There are little bird, mosaic bird um, baths and feeders. There's new clotheslines you'll notice while you're walking. And on the back side, there's a shuffleboard, picnic tables, and a little, little grills. And anybody can use the walking trail. Um, there's little, if you want to bring your puppy along, you can. There's the little puppy bag dispensers, in case you need them. So um, that was a nice grant application, and you'll see uh, there's benches along the way that are in beautiful, bright colors, and it's just a really nice addition there. There's even the high school is working on, because you had to include art in the project to get the grant, um, thus the mosaic bird baths and stuff. Uh, but the high school is actually painting a big old life-size cow <laughs> that will go on the lawn in front of the... Um, the group building at, at Orchard Apartments. So if you get a chance, stop down there and see that and take a look at Unity Park on Boston Road. That we have playground while you're there. All right, another great feel good project is um, the project you were talking about. This is American Legion Park. American Legion Park is between Darling Lane and Jarvis down in the village. So this project consists of some new parking, um, and this parking is pervious parking. So it looks like pavement, but it's got larger stones, so water can percolate through it. So again, part of the grant requirements for this round of grants were that you think about climate changes and being friendly to the environment. So this will look like pavement, and um, but it is more pervious, and uh, the highway department will have to do a few things to just maintain it in terms of blowing it like they're leaf blowing, and once a year taking a power spray and just spraying out all the aggregates so it keeps percolating. So we've got some new off-street parking. We've got some addition of trees. Um, there's actually more trees than what you see on this. Um, we have to incorporate shade structures. So more trees, good-sized picnic tables that are made out of resin materials, and large shade over those tables. Um, and uh, we have some some more trees going in, and then there'll be signage here. There'll be a history sign 
which talks about kind of how this was used for the Manchuk baseball team. And we have historic photos of the mill baseball team that used to play out here. Um, so there'll be a kind of a history sign here. There'll be a sign about you know climate and shading and why we've included shading in here in pervious parking lots. And then the grant acknowledgement sign. So she'll have some signs right here. And then this core is the new playground for this site. We're also going to be working with Sutton News Baseball to do, um, right now we have a permanent fence in the specs based on this public meeting we had on this one. We may consider a temporary fence depending on what the youth baseball thinks they need and what will work long term. So, and we are also doing new fencing around the basketball court as well. So full fencing. All right, so the playground, what's that look like? This is a much larger site, as you know. So, this is the playground at this site. And again, these are all chosen by neighborhood participants. Um, and um, so you've got a huge rack of swings back here, again, with the handicap swing. You have the saucer swing. These are musical instruments we apply to the Cultural Council for grants for portions of the musical instruments. You have their little ride on tractor and your fire truck um, and a little playhouse. So you, you can see you get all ages in these play elements. And then these are like, the, they're, they're called treetops. So they're shade cast by these. So this is the larger park here at American Legion Park. And that will, um, We'll know about that. This is a two-step grant. This is actually a federal money, um, and it will come down through the state. Um, we've already applied for this. This one, with prevailing wage and the parking lot and everything, is about um, $434,000. Yeah. So we've applied for a grant for half of it. And again, Sutton Re Recreational Resources is working with us on fundraising. As an example, Unity Park, that project over there on Boston Road, playground in eight or nine parking spaces, that was about $230,000. Um, we um, got a $100,000 grant, and they did a ton of fundraising. The town had to appropriate all two hundred and thirty, dollars but after the grant and the fundraising, $170,000 was able to be rolled forward to this project. So that's how important some recreational resources has been to helping the town's budget um, really um, absorb the costs of these really great uh, projects. Can I ask you, uh, are there yep. any quota parties involved with these parks? We just we had that discussion at our last meeting. Right now, they're not planned, but we're having basically a meeting, I believe it's the second week of May. Um, we're, we're starting that discussion about Van Dyke Park and their season and how we've had some issues there. Um, but it's going to wrap in all the parks. Uh, we've had the same questions asked at Unity Park. Um, so we're going to have that conversation and decide how the town wants to address it. Obviously, there's a monthly cost involved with that. But um, especially on this park, the closest bathroom, if you don't know Laura the set, <laughs> it's quite a ways away. <laughs> if you know Laura, you can just knock on her door. But, <laughs> but yeah, that's a great question. So like I said, second week of May, we're going to have the porta potty discussion. Um, it, it's about Huff Road, but um, we've already decided we need to have it about all our parks, including Shaw Farm as well, where if you haven't been there, there's some awesome walking trails at Shaw Farm. And we have a really... Uh, great trail steward down there who takes care of Shaw Farm for us largely um, and um, for free, which is kind of nice. All right, so those are the, the nice kind of community development projects we're working on. So there's two projects, one that I don't have a board for um, that you may have noticed. It's not actually on this map. It's going on right here. And this is in construction now. Right here in the um, industrial district down here is Blackstone Logistics Center. So Blackstone Logistics is going to be 650,000 square feet roughly, actually closer to 630 on their latest revision. It straddles three town lines. More than 40% of it is in Uxbridge, 20% of it is in Douglas, and the rest is in Sun. 
So that went through probably a nine month public hearing process with all three towns. Um, and um, that is in construction now. They still have not given us a tenant. So it, all we know is it qualifies under our use table as warehouse with distribution, um, which is different than, weird term, sorry, high cube fulfillment. So like an Amazon that ships by van right to your houses is called, it, that's a high cube distribution facility. So it, it won't be that kind of facility, but it can be something in between in their, in their supply chain. I can tell you it's not Amazon. That's what I can tell you. <laughs> so, but I don't know who it is. They don't know. They haven't released who that is. But that's in construction. And um, so far the construction is going well. The town has, or the towns, all three towns are working together. We have three different teams of consulting engineers that keep an eye on that on a weekly basis. So I don't see, you don't know what kind of business it is? That seems weird. We know it's warehouse with distribution. That's what we know. You know, under zoning, you can't really ask the name of a company. You can't say, if it's Walmart, we don't like it, or if it's this one, we do oh. like it. It's, the use table is just based on the use. It's called Blackstone Valley Logistics. But you yep, know. it's Blackstone Valley Logistics. Now, there is conditions. If you saw, so the, the, it was approved, and like in Sutton, we have 57 conditions. And one of the key conditions is that if what they actually, if the person they actually want to lease it to in the long run or sell it to doesn't strictly meet the definition in our bylaw of warehouse with distribution, they have to come back through the whole hearing process all over again. So it's on them to make sure whoever they ultimately lease it or sell it to strictly meets our definition. And they have similar conditions in Uxbridge and Douglas. Um, Uxbridge and Douglas, their industrial definitions are much broader than Sutton, so, so it's more kind of looking at ours. Um, and the building commissioner, who is also our zoning enforcement officer, when they come to do any kind of occupancy or talk about the details of fire suppression, which of course they can't do some of the fire suppression until they know exactly who it's going to be, if he rules that, uh-uh, you're not you're not meeting the definition, again, he'll kick them right back into the public hearing process. So there's all, again, 57 conditions just inside um, about how this works. So. What road is that on? Lackey Dam. Lackey Dam Road. So you, you'll notice it most if you're going down 146, you leave Sutton and you see the Dunkin' Donuts yep. over to your right in the pine, sand, and stone. Mm -hmm. It will be on your left. And you can't miss it. You won't miss it. No. It's all dug up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so there used to be the Mary Bedoyan sand pits. Those used to be the Bedoyan sand pits. Okay. They're both sides are Bedoyan sand pits, but those are the ones that have been out of operation in Sutton for the longest period of time. So they can they can put anything they want in there. It could be a strip club for all we know. No. I know for the stuff you want. But strip club. It has right. to meet the definition of warehouse with distribution. <laughs> So I suppose you can just that in a warehouse and stuff. Yeah, it has to be a warehouse. Yeah, it has to qualify as a warehouse with distribution. I mean, that would be yeah. a yeah. no strip club. Well, no. This gentleman has a yeah. pack for your warehouse and for a woman. There you go. That's, that's not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So up here, the other big going on. We just have an application filed for up here in the orange in northeast Sun. So this, as you might guess, is Route 146. This is Boston Road. So here's the light at Tony's Pizza. This is Boston Road out to Providence Road. And this street right here is Buttonwood Ave. The cut through <laughs> from Providence Road. So this land is bounded by Boston Road here. Buttonwood here, and Providence Road here. So we just got a filing for this part of this site. All right? As you may know, this entire area, including the town sand pits, the aggregate sand pits, and the Worcester sand and gravel sand pits, were all procured by Unified. So you, who's Unified? Unified started as Atlas Box, owned by Glenn McAleer and Art Mahassel, and they took on a partner. They're still the majority owner of Unified. Their partner is an arm of the craft group. So 
the Rand Whitney, the packaging kind of arm of the craft group. Obviously, there's synergies there. They were competition, but now they're working together. So, so unif that's what unified is. It's the unification of the packaging arm of the craft group and Atlas Box here in Sun. Again, majority owned still by Atlas Box um, and Art Mahassel and Len McAleer. So that is the entity that bought all of this, about just over 400 acres total. It does stretch into to the town of Millbury, just under 30 acres in the town of Millbury as well. So, um, so they have a residential portion and they have an office light industrial portion. And they just filed the first site plan for kind of the Worcester sand and gravel town sand pit part of this property. So those are known as buildings two and three because there will be likely three buildings in the end. So, this is the site plan <laughs> for buildings two and three. So again, this is Buttonwood Ave here, Boston Road here, and Providence Road here. So, the planning board already approved this roadway. It's one mile long. And it links Providence Road to Boston Road. Right now, it will be private, but not gated. We are talking about whether it should be public, and if we were going to take it on as a public road, what they would need to do for us. Because obviously, maintaining a one-mile roadway that ranges in width from 40-plus feet to almost 60 feet wide with the associated drainage is not inexpensive. So, but this roadway is already approved. So, again, this is the south side against Buttonwood. There will likely be a filing in the very near future for what's known as Building 1, which will be a very large building here, okay, up to and over, likely, the Millbury line. So, Buildings 2 and 3, I'm going to squint and show my age a little bit. Okay, Building 3, 343,000 square feet, so a little bit, well, I shouldn't say a little, about 100,000 square feet smaller than the current Atlas Box location. And building, so that's building three. Building two is 652,000 square feet. So um, the, the current Atlas box is probably about this big. So you're talking one and a half times the size of the current Atlas box structure on, at uh, 223 Worcester Providence Turnpike. Excuse me, can you yeah. repeat where the roads are currently right now? So this is Boston Road here. Right. So if you draw a line up, then you'll hit Buttonwood. So this is Buttonwood. Yeah. And then this is Providence. And Hatchery Drive, if you're familiar with where Hatchery is, that's right here. Where's our well? Our yes. well's right here. <laughs> yeah, so this is Wilkinsonville Well, head. Um, needless to say, uh, Preventure Well is their well consultant, and they're run by Whitesville Water District and Whitewater. Um, so they get copies of all of them. So they, they are consulted through the whole process. Um, I was just watching emails come back and forth today between their prevention engineering and their engineers. Because obviously, this is one of three wells um, that is part of the Wilkinsonville Water District. And it's the oldest well. It has the lowest pump rate, but it's still critical to the system. And it will be you know, critical to these buildings as well, because their water will come directly out of that well. So super important to make sure this is protected. And there's also what is called zone of contribution. It's called the zone two. It's uh, hydrogeologists go out when you put in a well, and they mark on the ground, well, not on the ground, on the map, the area of above ground and underground flow that contributes to a wellhead. And you can kind of see the line. It's right here. And it looks like a big amoeba. And that is the zone two, and it, it goes this way. It goes towards Dudley Road. That contributes to this wellhead. So we have regulations of what we can and can't do inside that zone of contribution, again, to protect the water that goes into the well. So um, they have filed for site plan approval, which is just kind of how the building sits, how much parking they need, what it looks like, those kind of things. They try and look for a groundwater protection permit to say how they're compliant with those regulations and will protect this wellhead. They filed for a use permit for the where this these will both be warehouse with distribution use. Um, and these will both be fully or primarily for unified. Um, 
the 223 Worcester Province location contains all of their manufacturing and it contains a ton of storage right now. Um, I don't know if you know this about Atlas Box, but they work in so many industries. One of their big clients is um, Yankee Candle. They have what's called a pulp process over there in the plant. It kind of looks like Willy Wonka when you first see it because there's steam coming up in big pots and stuff. They basically collect newspaper um, from the telegram or newspaper suppliers. They make it into a big slurry and they pop it into this steam machine that presses out, if you've ever gone to Yankee Candle and brought home more than a few candles, in the little things like you get at McDonald's to put your drinks in. That's one of their primary cl clients. If you go into that section of their factory, there's metal molds pushing out those candle holders. And then they go into a dryer tunnel and there's stacks and stacks up to the ceiling of the, the crates of Yankee Candle things. So that's one of the kind of things they do. Another thing they do is if you've ever been to a trade show in your life or like if you go to a home show and there's those lovely display booths that are lovely lit and they have the samples of things or whatever, those trade show displays are shipped all over the world for different conferences. Atlas Box is one of the companies that makes custom crating for trade, trade show displays. So sometimes you'll walk into Atlas Box and you'll see a big trade show display for like I don't know, uh, you know, a blood pressure medication, and you're like, why is that here? Well, it's there because they're crafting custom foam inserts and custom wood crating so that they can take that display apart, pack it in there, and seal it, and ship it anywhere without anything breaking, anything cracking, anything. So they do the same for custom military equipment. If you have a specialized... I don't know, night vision goggle that needs to be shipped with a, with a bunch of soldiers and it can't be disturbed. They do custom crating for those kind of things too. The, the range of the industries they work for is mind-boggling. Um, and they also do, your, your, now with Craft Group, they do corrugated boxes for everybody to use um, in all different kinds of industries. <laughs> but only a portion of their existing facility can be dedicated to manufacturing because when those trade show companies aren't using their booths, Atlas Box stores them for them. So they have like a storage arm. So they need more areas where they can store not only the product they're making before it's shipped, their components, their wood and stuff that they use to make their creating, um, but also the things that they store for their clients when they're not in use, that they make money off of, I'm sure, as well. So these buildings will primarily take any storage from the main building, so that whole building can be manufacturing now, and then they anticipate some additional manufacturing need as the years move forward in these buildings as well. Right now, they rent at least six different spaces and communities in the valley to, to meet their storage needs. So they, what they want to do is basically have their world headquarters in, inside, just everything they do inside. Um, they are, of course, located overseas in Northern Ireland, in Malaysia, in any number of countries, but this is their world headquarters here inside. So these two buildings will be primarily for their use. So as you might guess, um, they're just industrial in nature. These are truck parking bays. These are truck docking bays. This is employee parking. On this building, all of this is employee parking. These are truck um, docking bays. And this is truck parking. So, and these are some visuals. Um, if you're on the road that drives through the park, this is, these are rendering. So this is the closest building that you'll see, but you can see how it lays down. It kind of winds through the main road, and this is kind of an aerial of how that sits. So if you were familiar with the site in the past, this building sits down where the Worcester Sand and Gravel Pitch used to be, closest to the river next to Buttonwood. And this building will actually be partially under the power lines, like between them, not under them. So that's the one thing that's a wild card on this that we're all wondering is is how it will work with the power lines because they want them they can't put a structure under the power lines only roadways so how they're going to position it with those huge power lines that exist out there and maximize the site so again industrial building 
Um, they wanted to look consistent with their building, so they've got basically the stonework on the bottom, and then just the glass front where employees or, or um, I won't say the public will enter because the public will <laughs> likely never enter those. But. And then uh, the challenge for the town is really going to be how do you take a site that's been a sand pit since 1920 and dress it up a bit so, so it looks a little, a little um, more corporate. Um, and we'll figure that out. Um, they do have an aggressive landscaping plan and they've been working with Conservation Commission for almost a year now to avoid wetland impacts and work on vegetation. So, so that is this, this is the big one that was filed this month. Like I said, it was likely to be followed within six months, I would say, by building one. Building one will be primarily behind Al's rubbish and take up a huge bulk of the site because it is anticipated to be well over a million square feet. Um, so we'll see when that one files. And that one is the one where we'll be really focusing a lot of attention on traffic impact and how that will work because we want to, uh, uh, the board when they approve the roadway already restricted truck travel. If you leave Boston Road on the new roadway, you can't turn left and get in a truck uh, because the intersection of Providence Road and Boston Road can't handle truck turns now. Don't want to put any more in there. And, um, and we're hoping actually and have projected with our regional planning agency that by having this connector road here, um, it'll take some of the pressure off this road system here. Um, but we've already negotiated some improvements at this intersection regardless, including safe passage with crosswalks with um, button signalization if you need to use the crosswalks to get across. Is, is the majority of the uh, trucks going in and out are going to be on Boston Road? Yes. Yes. The majority will be on Boston Road. Is that a bridge going to be a problem? The railroad bridge? Um, no. That's probably. Yeah, if they go north, you mean? No. It has clearance for most standard size trucks. Yes. So but very little flow is projected to go in that direction, at least for buildings two and three. We only have preliminary looks at what building one might do. And the planning board, because we knew development was coming here, it's just a given. Any of the sand pits, were, once they're done mining, you basically have a level building pad. So it was always anticipated that any of the sand pits, where market 32 is, was a sand pit. Here's a sand pit. These are both sand pits. Would, development would come to those sites. So we worked with our regional planning agency and we actually did traffic modeling for any number of uses here before they even bought the land. Um, and um, we, we don't show a ton of impact in Sutton here. Where you see the impact from traffic going north here on Providence Road is in Millbury Center. Because, you know, when you get to Millbury Center, You've got Elm and those. It's already at a, like a red level as it is. So we're working with the town of Millbury and the town of Grafton to, to do what we can to accommodate our growth needs, but also not ruin them at the same time. And we, we'd like to think they do that too. But. Exactly where is the new road? Where did it start and where does it end exactly? Um, so if you're on Boston Road, you go past the Market 32, you're going towards Wilkinsonville Center. You'll drive along, and I don't know how many of you notice, there's a gorgeous, there's the house on the corner of Dudley and Boston that has the two beautiful sycamores, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's Mr. Dorian's house. It's a little cape that sits back. It used to have the circular driveway, and they took out half of it when they put in the lights. Keep going. And then you see the White House on your right. There's a White House on your right. It was bought by the owner of uh, St. Lauren Hare Studio. And she was going to relocate her studio there and never proceeded with it. She had it approved, but she never proceeded. The entrance, this entrance, will be just across from that. There's a third sycamore. It's a gorgeous sycamore on your left, five feet wide. We're trying our hardest to have them avoid taking that sycamore. But it will be basically between where the old entrance used to be to the sand pit. Remember, there was a building that's now demolished and a gate, and that sycamore. So it'll be right there across from the White House. That's where you'll hit Boston Road. Even with these two buildings, they're going to have to do a turn lane. So they'll have to widen Boston Road at that location and make sure there's a dedicated turn lane. So people who are going can still proceed. You won't get held up there. Um, 
on Providence Road, um, <coughs> if you're going towards Millbury, um, Al's Rubbish is on your left. Um, the road would be, um, there's one little parcel, probably 300 feet, it's owned by Aggregate before Al's Rubbish, and the road would go in just before that parcel. So about 300 feet before Al's Rubbish, kind of across from, um, across from where Mayfield Plastics is, which is now unified. We <laughs> want that too. So, yeah. So that's where you'll go. And the road winds, following a lot of the hall roads, actually, that were inside the pit. Uh, it winds for a mile. It's a mile inside the pit. My question is back to the well. What monitoring system is going in in case there's a fuel spill by one of the trucks? Are any, of that, any other materials that are there? Well, the water, the dist the water yeah. district, as you know, is not directly affiliated with the town. They're a private right. water district, public and you know. But the planning board requires that they go through a permit process and receive anything and everything the district requires of them before we will approve the project. So, um, and if there's certain conditions the water district wants us to restate in our permit, we'll restate those. Um, so that's really based on whatever the water district wants. So they already have monitoring wells around the thing from the earthroom wall. They had to put in monitoring wells all around that arc um, when earth removal was going on in there, and, and they had to submit those. So I know they've already requested, and we've already agreed to restate in, in our conditions that they'll do whatever monitoring Wilkinsonville Water wants them to do on a six-month or an annual basis to make sure there's nothing happening there. And then the placement of the pavement, basically, within the groundwater discharge, um, it has to have certain kinds of berms. It has to go to certain kinds of catch basins that capture and hold VOC, so volatile organic compounds like gasoline, like oil. So if you had a spill, even just a leak out of a truck of oil, that the parking lot is designed to contain that and pull it to a catch basin that's meant, that's designed to capture it and hold it. Um, and those have to be cleaned out, I think, every quarter or so. And that's a requirement. So we'll have our own standards that our consulting engineer wants in place for basic protection, whether there's a wellhead district there or not, like what I just told you about. But we will also enforce and restate if the water district wants us to any safeguards that they impose on their wellhead as well. The hazardous materials, uh, is, is there any way of knowing what hazardous materials they, they will be storing? There? Yeah, under state law, any business that has hazmat on site, they have to file, I don't know the technical just for that. Just for that one little business. They have to file the plan annually with the town, usually through the fire department, um, and um, they have to, they keep an inventory of basically the maximum amount they'll have on the site and the minimum amount they'll have on the site. And any hazmat that might be on that site has to be on that. Is it an MSDS? MSDS? Did I get the SDS? SDS. <laughs> I knew you'd know. <laughs> on that sheet, um, so we know at all times what's there. Um, right now because these two buildings um, are going to be a unified buildings. They don't anticipate anything on these sites that isn't at their existing building, and they have minimal hazmat, I think, in the current unified building. Very minimal. Um, if any, do they have? Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think they had anything that qualified as hazmat. So in these two buildings, um, that's not anticipated, but there's a state law, a local fire law, um, and a building code a requirement to make sure hazmat is tracked and, and annually reported, not just at the beginning. So, so what a district does not mm -hmm. test for an awful lot of chemicals. In fact, they test for very little. Not, yeah, I can't speak to that, obviously, because again, they're not affiliated directly with the town. So, um, but the water district is owned technically by every single person who lives in that district. So. You, you have the right to have a conversation if, if you have some concerns. But, yeah, they do have right now monitoring wells along this edge um, that were related to the earth removal that used to occur on the Worcester Sand and Gravel site 
and I know they were talking about installing additional ones and increasing the amount of things they were going to test for in these wells and those monitoring wells. So, because you are next to, I mean, you're next to truck docking bays and truck parking. So, you want to make sure that's safe. Well, I got a question. It's always on my mind. Providence Road. Why is Providence Road a town road? And you got, if you can answer that, you're going to well, join my I staff. Somebody do something about it because I, I hear say, I hear in Grafton now, they're changing that section of Grafton from something to where uh, maybe they come on farm or whatever, and they're. That is a town road, and they're changing it to a state highway, which it is. Now, why can't something do that? Why should we have to take care of that of, section? Of a section. Yeah, that's Singletary a Road is a state road. The M route. Mm -hmm. And Central Turnpike, that's another road that mm -hmm. should be a highway. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, so I can tell you, I can answer some and can't answer some. Okay. I have never understood and it has never been explained to me why Route 122A slash Providence Road in Sutton is state numbered, but it's local control. It's a question I can ask the highway super, and we can report back and give you that answer. If he knows it, because I, I have no idea. I've seen it Central? in other sections of in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of towns you go through, the state road ends, mm -hmm. and then it begins again, but it's, you know. Right. So I, I think that's an important thing. You spend a lot of money in the highway department for yeah. the road, and somebody should be looking sure. into that. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, I'm happy to pass that question on to our highway superintendent, and he's an extremely responsive guy. So if I get an answer, I'll filter it back through Michelle, and if he knows the answer, he might not know it either. But well, and if if we're to intend to do anything about it, I can ask him that as well. You go to Ohio. Now. <laughs> now, Central Turnpike, the state, when I first started here, the central, the state talked about, let's do a deal. Let's do a little deal making. The M route starts on west, in West uh, Millbury, which, of course, if you don't know, used to be Sutton's North Parish. So if you want to yeah. irritate an old timer in Millbury, just say, ah, you're just our North Parish. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Millbury was part of us once. So the state route starts at the church in West Millbury. You'll see there's a little sign, State Highway Begins, and it goes all the way up Singletary Ave. It takes a right turn onto Boston Road. It goes all the way down Boston Road to the intersection with Putnam Hill Road. It takes a left turn and goes all the way down Putnam Hill Road to the church in Douglas. That is the M route. And if you kind of look, it's kind of a weird M, but it is an M. <laughs> the state, when I first started here, we we're talking about let's do a deal. We'll take Central Turnpike, you take the M route. And there was a ton of protest about us doing that for two reasons. So the Central Turnpike is, as you know, it's a at least a 60 foot right of way. It's a very wide right of way, paved probably 28 to 30 feet. But the right of way that the town would own and control is, it, it, that the town does own and control is 60 feet. One of the fears was that the state took over Central Turnpike because it is a east-west connector road between 146 and 395, in effect, that they would widen it, they would do things to it, and that the residents would not be happy with. Even though it's called Turnpike, so it's not like Eight Lots Road, <laughs> there were, the residents were very weary that if the state took over Central Turnpike, it would become a full-blown turnpike and change the nature and be very scary. So that was one of the concerns. The second concern was that even though we'd love to turn over the um, maintenance of Central Turnpike, when you think about the M route, it's not the easiest stretch of roadway to maintain and at the time hadn't been maintained for a very long time. So those stretches of Singletary Ave and Putnam Hill Road needed big drainage fixes, needed all kinds of work. And they even threw in, well, you know, we'll do all that stuff and then we'll give it to you. And you'll give us Central. But they never went anywhere. So that's why we still own Central Turnpike. They still own the M route. 
And they have made some improvements along the Emerald, thankfully. They've improved some drainage, done some repaving along Putnam Hill, did a small section of the sidewalk along Singletary, and we continue to work with them to try to make that those improvements. But your guess is as good as mine on 122A in Providence Road, but I'll ask the highway super, and I'm happy to ask him if there's any plan to seek the state to take that. And, um, and I, I have this sneaking suspicion that let's say, you know what, no, you can keep it, and we'll just take off any reference to 122A. <laughs> but, but we'll see if we can get them to. Well, Grafton seems to be changing. So that's, yeah, I don't know it, if that's true or not. Somebody told me that. Well, he knows. He has great connections in Grafton. I'm sure he can reach out because he worked for Millbury for years. Yeah. So he can reach out and, and see what the deal is with that. And he is an active member of the Highway Association group. So um, I'll ask him the question and see if we can get those answers back to you. Can we get back to the third building? The third building? Uh, yeah, you really don't know much about. No, the no. third building. Um, so what I can tell you about the third building is it is a client of Unify. That's what I know. And again, they don't, we don't allow high cube fulfillment centers in Sutton. That is an, uh, not an allowed use here in Sutton. So they anticipate that will also be some type of warehouse with distribution. So, but at over a million square feet, the big thing there is traffic. So if these buildings are wholly unified, there'll be traffic. But we already know from having Atlas Box in operation so long that it's minimal. We still need the turning lanes out on Boston Road and some things. But it's that third building that will be tricky with traffic. So client of these companies, that's what I know. Warehouse with distribution, that's what I know. But until they file the site plan, um, we won't have the details. Because you can imagine, a unified type warehouse distribution is very different than, uh, say, uh, uh, like a Home Depot warehouse with distribution that's going to a lot of stores or whatever. Different flow. So even though they meet the use category, they can have very different impacts. And that's what the site plan and special permit process is about, digging into those numbers and talking about traffic impact, the aesthetics, sound, um, lighting, all of that, um, and its impact on the surrounding area and the larger roadway network. So, so you have all those issues mm -hmm. that you don't know about, mm -hmm. but now when you learn all of the problems, then what do you do? So during site plan review, they file a traffic study, they'll file a sound study, they'll file lighting studies, photometric plans, and we hire consulting engineers. And the consulting engineers will um, review all those studies, make sure they've been done with the proper methodology, and then they'll call out any potential issues. Um, one of the things you'll see on a traffic study is um, right now, the intersection of, say, um, Route 146 and Boston Road, the lights, operate at a certain level. It's like a report card, level A, B, C, D, E. If you get to an F, that's bad, just like on your report card. So they can tell you right now how that operates. Is it a level B intersection? Is it a level C? And one of the things you look at, for instance, is now they'll show you in the traffic study how much more traffic they're pumping in, exactly how much in the peak hours, how much per hour, and then they'll show what it does to the level of service. So if you see a level of service, say, go from an A to a D, well, you need to fix that a little bit. If you see an F, we're not permitting you. If, it's, if you see a D, you need to tell us how you're going to, an A to a D is pretty bad. So you need to do something more. So we use the technical data that's filed and reviewed to our, our engineers to see whether something is acceptable with mitigation or whether, no way, you can't do that. Um, not only are these plans reviewed by our consulting engineers, but they're reviewed by all the department heads. So like the fire department requires that on these plans they do what's called an auto turn. They have a template for their largest fire apparatus, and they make them basically run it around these plans and make sure it doesn't overhang and hit anything. It can make all the turns, those kind of things. They talk to them about hazmat materials and those kind of things. So every department in the town reviews these plans based on their specialties as well. So it gets a lot of eyes on it, and we work with 
the developers not only to fix things that the actual studies show could go wrong and make sure what they're proposing to fix or mitigate those things might work, but we always condition any action we take. So, for instance, on Blackstone Logistics, because we don't know who the tenant is, and there's very big differences in certain kinds of warehouse with distribution, we, all three towns, put a condition in there that they have to do continuing traffic monitoring and studies every six months for three years after they open. And if at any point the traffic numbers are more than, I think it's 10% higher than they projected, they basically have to come back to the towns. We will sit with the um, planning boards, the police chiefs, and the highway departments, pick up where the trouble spots are, and they have to fix them. So like their ultimate approval isn't the end of it on big projects because you just don't know. Until it actually is in operation, stuff happens. So you've got to have conditions that safeguard you years out. So I anticipate those same kind of conditions will be put in place not just for these two buildings, which we anticipate a lesser impact from, but in, t in, in particular for the larger buildings. So. So we, we, if we see things that are wrong in the initial filings, they have to fix them. Um, and then we put in conditions that let us come back and make them fix things after the fact. And in the process, when you're dealing with larger developers, we work with them. Um, they obviously want their project approved and accepted by the community. So we will work with them um, as much as we can. Some companies have more means than others to look at things that are already wrong. In this case, we know we have an issue at Boston Road and Providence Road. It's a horrible intersection right now. Um, so we've already talked to them and worked with them um, to, for them to already do some preliminary engineering design of how we can improve the existing Providence Road and Boston Road. So we already have preliminary engineering plans that they've worked out and given us from their engineers to kind of, that we can use as a base for improvements ourselves or that they might pursue for goodwill as they move through this process. So there's always a lot going on. There's certain things that you have to do and make sure comply with the bylaws the residents have voted. And there's certain things the staff tries to do on behalf of the residents in the town that aren't covered by the bylaws to try to get the best project with the best positive effects, basically. So there's a lot going on all the time here. We are also working with this team. Um, we need major improvements to the Wilkinsonville sewer system. The original pipes are what are called AC pipes. They're asbestos um, pipes, um, clay, basically, with asbestos in them. And the one, they go cross country, and they go under the railroad, and they're not in a casing. So as you can guess, every time a train goes over the tracks, they get vibration and they've had several cracks. Every bit of sewer from Northeast Sutton, over a thousand users goes through that length of pipe. It's the number one issue that came in in our comprehensive waste management plan. So we're working with this company um, because they're bringing on a bunch of jobs. We're filing a grant that we qualify for because they're bringing on job creation. So we're filing for a grant for part of the sewer improvement costs. They're going to give us money as a match for this, and then we're putting in some town money for a match. So that's almost a four to five million dollar new sewer pump station and a bunch of new lines so that asbestos lines go out of service completely. Um, and then we can pick up, there's the few other businesses that are on Providence Road and houses that could use sewer if they're going to benefit. So we would have stuff so those users could also tie in. So the residents and businesses in that area get some additional benefit. So while we're looking at any new development, we try to take a broad view and say, all right, how can the town benefit beyond just what's in the book, what we have to make sure they comply with? So we're already partnering with them, using their job creation to our benefit to apply for a grant that's all about job creation to get a new sewer. Um, pump station and a new sewer line in that part of town that will safeguard the thousand users that are already on the system. So lots going on, lots of moving parts every day, um, and these are just a few of the things going on, but you know I'm happy at any time I work for you, so if you have any questions, 
Um, I'm happy to come down to the Senior Center on a regular basis if you, if you want to do this every once in a while. Send me an email, pick up the phone. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Unfortunately, some of our unofficial social media sources aren't the most accurate, <laughs> so, so I always prefer people call <laughs> and ask the question. But uh, for, for such a small population town at under 10,000, there's a lot going on in this little town, and, and I like to make sure everybody knows what's going on. Um, if you've had a chance to look at the planning board page and our, our website in particular, it is technically award-winning <laughs> because uh, we put a lot of stuff out there. Anything that's in front of the planning board, you can find all the plans, all the applications, all of them are on the planning board's page, so you can look at them at any time. So, and if you saw something in a planning board meeting and you want to look at it again, there's actually a little link on our page with all of our past meeting materials in it. So, but if that doesn't work and you just want me to send you something, I'm happy to do that. Why you standing there? Explain to us the color codes. Ah, okay. <laughs> all right. So, again, over 82% of the town is rural residential. In the, this year, right now, what that means is any new lots that are created have to be at least 80,000 square feet, so a little under two acres, and they have to have 250 feet of frontage along an existing road, public or private, and if it's private, it has to be deemed safe and adequate by the planning board, which basically means by the fire department. So, so that's the standard for any new lots in the majority of the town. <clears throat> There's many locations, including here in Northeast Sutton, where the lots aren't that size. These lots were created before the new zoning went in place. So those are grandfathered lots they can be built on um, as approved. So, but any new lots have to be that larger size. The purple areas are rural resident, are suburban residential. Lots can be a little bit smaller, anywhere from 20,000 square feet to 60,000 square feet, based on whether you have water and or sewer. So 60,000 if you don't have water or sewer, 40,000 with water or sewer, 20,000 with water and sewer. So again, teeny tiny part of town. Intentionally, I put this down here, but again, I can't see it. <laughs> so, um, oh, actually, see, I was wrong. Nine, rural residential, 91.7% of town, okay? And again, rural residential, only home businesses. So no tax generation other than your real estate taxes, which are substantial, I'm sure you'll agree, going on in the white areas. So suburban residential is only 128 acres, 0.6 part of town. That's the purple areas. The green areas, some of you might notice, are industrial villages. So this is Wilkinsonville Village, named after Samuel Slater's brother-in-law. And this is Manshog Village, this yellow, Area is not industrial, the whole thing is green. Um, that is Manchog Village. And the village districts are 1.5% of the town. The village districts allow smaller scale businesses and residential and a mix of the two, which is very traditional in those mill villages. All right, the red is business highway. So it goes from Central Turnpike to the Millbury Town Line and is a traditional business district. Uh, restaurants, retail, different kinds of small businesses and large businesses are allowed in that district. The business highway district is only 2.1% of the town of Sutton. So the industrial district is yellow. Um, most of the orange areas used to be yellow. Pretty much anywhere there was a sand pit used to be yellow. Per my previous comments, it was always anticipated when the sand pits finished operations, they'd be a perfect site for industrial development. So, however, back in probably the year before I got here, 1998, the town worked with our regional planning agency and came up with this office light industrial district, which has a few, so no longer allows commercial earth removal because that can be very disruptive, not only to the area around it, but to the environment, water tables, things like that. So. That was taken out of this district, and a few things were added in. You can do like hotels and some other things in that district. So it's more of a kind of a business industrial mix, the orange area. So the yellow area is pure industrial. Uh, Lord and Propane, 
the rock crusher rental guys on 146 and the old industrial park that sits behind Brickstone Kitchen. Those are the current industrial areas. That is only, again, 0.6% of the sun. The office light industrial areas are where most of the development's going on now. Again, these used to be the sand pits. They're now being built out. So those, the office light industrial district currently amounts to about 3.5% of town. So um, if you add up the non-residential, so village, business highway, and industrial, and office light industrial, you're talking seven, um, just over 8% of the town is available for super active tax base and job creation. The rest is on you <laughs> in terms of your real estate taxes. So you might say, hey, there's four other miles of Route 146. Why are we not doing anything with that? Um, Route 146 was not just built with state money, it was built with federal money. And so from Cold Spring Brook, which is right here, all the way to the Rhode Island line, that is a no access highway. No new curve cuts can be created all the way to the Rhode Island line because of the funding that was used to create the roadway. So that's why we don't have, and the state owns an awful lot of the land on either side of the highway in this district, but you can't put new curb cuts. So when we're looking at development along 146, we're centered around the exits and entrances because that's the only place we can really create development and then it would come on the ramps. So no new curb cuts from here all the way to Rhode Island. So, um, so that's what those districts mean. That's a great question. Uh, are we in line for an increase in affordable housing? Uh, the state just passed a law, uh, and since we bought a graft into the NBCA station, I heard that we are in line. And yeah. where would that go? Uh, sure. So, um, as you might know, um, way back, Civil Rights Act, 1969, included a whole segment on housing regulation and affordable housing production. Uh, laws derived from the Civil Rights Act, one of those was the Chapter 40D law in the state of Massachusetts. 40D mandates the production of affordable housing in every municipality in the Commonwealth. At least 10% of our housing stock needs to be affordable in, a, in compliance with HUD limits. Um, I don't have those right here, but I have them in the desk drawer. I can let you know what those are. But um, Sutton has 1.5 percent. All right, so we did a housing needs study of probably two years ago now that showed the people that live in this town right now, not even the ones that want to live here or need to work here, live here for these new businesses, well over 25 percent, almost 30 percent of the residents who live here now need access to affordable housing. They're spending well over 30 percent of their income a certain percentage, over 50% of their income, on housing costs. Those include rent or mortgage, um, taxes, and uh, insurance, house insurance. So those are your housing costs and your base. So there's definitely always, uh, the housing needs show this, uh, again, a need in this town for people who already live here to do more market rate or HUD affordable housing. So, uh, we've long been looking at that, seeing how we can address that, and still maintain kind of the character of the community. Luckily, it's a big community. So, as you might guess, um, when you're talking about multifamily housing or market rate housing, you need to think about water and sewer. Our infrastructure is extremely limited. We have water and sewer here. We have water and sewer here. That's it. Okay? And it goes all the way to the villas. So, so, so it's a very limited area. The new law you're talking about um, was part of the Economic Development Bill last year from the governor, and it contained kind of a housing choice pod in there. And it basically said, if you are an MBTA community, you must not, it's not a production like 40B, a production mandate. It's a, I don't know what you want to call it, uh, availability mandate. You must make sure there is a reasonable amount of land available for multifamily housing development at a density, a minimum density of 15 units per acre. 
Um, from what I just told you about zoning, 90 whatever percent, did I say 91 percent of the town is at a density of basically two acres for one unit. <laughs> so now you've got to go to 15. So the functional density in parts of town like the villas at Pleasant Valley, up here um, in the uh, highly developed is much higher than that. Our functional density in parts of town is seven dwellings per acre, as high as seven dwellings per acre when you look at the functional density. But 15 units per acre is still, it's a lot. So because we abut Grafton, who is an actual MBTA community, even though we don't have any MBTA services here, we're pulled into that group of communities. Out of 381 communities in the Commonwealth, 175 fall into MBA community status. About 100 out of the 175 are adjacent communities. No service, just next to a town who has a service, okay? So, um, reasonable size is considered an area of about 50 acres, okay? It doesn't have to be in a whole block. At least 25 acres has to be in a big blob. And then no other part of the 50 acres can be less than 5 acres, okay? So, you either adopt under the current draft, we're still in draft form, <laughs> but under the current draft, you either adopt that and designate that within your town, or you lose access to three pots of funding. One of them is a housing creation funding. Well, if you don't want to create housing, you don't need that funding, so whatever. Um, another pot of funding we actually haven't used in Sutton, but it could be useful. The third pot of funding is a really important part of funding. That sewer grant I talked about, that's this pot of funding. It's called MassWorks funding. It pays for the infrastructure for not just job creation, but housing creation. <laughs> so it's critical funding in a lot of communities, um, even communities more so even than Sutton, uh, who does amazingly well with our financial picture, to actually build the, the utilities you need to support business development and housing. So if you don't comply, you can't apply. You can't even apply. You don't have a lesser ranking. You can't even apply for those funds. It's a pretty big hammer. So it's not a mandate like 40B, which we're trying to work on for the needs of our own residents, but it's kind of a hammer. So the Board of Selectmen, I did meet with them and the Planning Board, and we did send a letter because we have some real concerns with the legislation. Um, it was touted as kind of trying to, trying to be fair and inclusive. Well, only 175 communities have to deal with it out of 381. That's a red flag right there. We, we don't just need multifamily in 175 communities. We need it in every community in the Commonwealth. And by focusing that need, that production on 175 communities, you're forcing a higher level of production, a higher density on a smaller group when you can maybe go with a lesser density if you spread it across the whole Commonwealth. And by doing that, you can allow communities who are vastly different in their setting, in their infrastructure, in their ability to absorb housing, to do something that's more in scale with their community. And that way, the 10% across the board by 40B is actually more equitable than what is currently proposed. So there are communities within our regional planning system, um, if you do the math, 15 units per acre, 50 acres, minimum, 750 units, multifamily housing. We currently have about 3,500 units of housing inside. 750 is over a 20% increase. And I think you all know, if you build it in today's atmosphere, if you can build it, it will be built. So there's a problem with the state not thinking about the flip side for us. We understand we need multifamily housing, we need affordable housing, but we also need the sewer and the water infrastructure, and we need to consider impacts on our public services and our schools. So, and we're different, and we're an awesome state because we're different. Cambridge is different than Northampton is different than Sutton is different, and when you impose a, everybody who's in the 175, by the way, not the 381, has to allow for an additional 750 units of period, no matter how big you are, how small you are, there's at least one community in our district where if they were required to do 750, their housing would double by 100%. 100%. And there, the next town over from an MBA TA community, 
So what's the chance that the 750 will get built? Probably pretty good, especially in today's atmosphere where we're in Massachusetts, where we're 200,000 units shy for our population on housing. Pretty good chance it will be built. So the selectmen um, and the planning board wrote a letter with our concerns about that legislation. Still in draft. We're hoping that they'll step back, think about it a little more equitably, and in the meantime, in Sutton, we are in compliance for this year, so we can apply for our sewer grant this year. We're ever moving towards greater financial stability. So maybe at some point, it won't be as important to be, have access to these grants. So that's another thing. You can just say, I don't want the money. Um, so that's another step we're taking. But we're hoping they'll think about not just comments they received from Sutton, but also from our regional planning agency, from the Rural Mass Council, and a lot of other people um, and communities about, we get it, we all need affordable, we all need multifamily housing. The employees, the thousand plus employees who are going to work on the unified site need some place to live. Why can they not live here? We get it, but it needs to be proportional, it needs to be, you know, and there needs to be time to think about the water, the sewer, the public service impact, the school impact, and all of that. So the, that legislation is in place, still in draft form. We're in compliance this year, because to be in compliance this year, we just had to have the presentation with the selectmen, which we did, and we just had to fill out an information form. Next year, because we are not in the actual MBATA communities, we have a year to plan and think once they release the final regulations and we know what we're really dealing with. And then we'll be moving forward at the end of next year, depending on the draft regulations again, and the beginning of 2014 to do public information like this, have a community conversations, and think about what we want to do as a community, whether we want to just go, okay, no more grants, we're going to have to put the bills ourselves, or whether in response to our housing needs study, we really do want to see if there's some areas on sewer and water in particular where we could accommodate at least some amounts of multifamily and more affordable housing, and how we would do that to make sure not only do you have multifamily, but it's actually affordable. So, because I could go on for hours about how the HUD tables for rentals in particular aren't all that affordable out in this region. <laughs> They're just not. Uh, we can take one last question, Linda, and if anyone wants to see Jen, you can see her afterwards. Yeah. Well, we have a couple empty rooms open also, but we have a class coming in in about 10 minutes. Yeah. So, Linda? Just briefly, uh -huh. um, the 55 year old development on the Oxford Road. I knew we were going to ask that, and I, I just met with the developer just yeah. before I came here. Uh, I met with the developer on RMC Road. So you'll remember that was 93 units, over 55, uh, three tiers of pricing, blah, blah, blah. So he brings it out into the market, the designer who wants to stay involved, and he finds the land on the end of RMC not the easiest parcel on the planet. Okay. It's got some areas of ledge, it's got lots of wetlands. The development costs in today's atmosphere, astronomical. So he came back with a builder who wanted to work with him and build it with him, and they asked for some adjustments. Thinking about single units, not attached units, come down to 70-something units. But he wanted to do, we require that at least 10% of those units be affordable. Again, trying to accommodate our own population that needs that affordability. This developer wanted to do no affordable. And then he said, all right, I'll do four <laughs> affordable, but they're gonna, not going to look like anybody else's house. So basically, you'll drive through your neighborhood and go, those are the affordable people. <laughs> so we're like, no, that's not going to <laughs> So we have that's a true. new builder <coughs> who I met with literally right before this meeting, really going back to the single up to four units attached, kind of the same original design, same little cottagey elements, though that's a little harder in four units attached, but they did a nice job with it originally. And um, he just needs an education on how affordability works and, and run to run the numbers. So that project will move forward. It's just very, very tough on that particular site with the high construction costs right now. So I'm already hearing from some of the builders we deal with that some things are starting to ease back down. So hopefully we'll get to a place where cost-benefit works on that site, but really good meeting today, um, kind of going back to the original design, which has some singles, some twos, some threes, and some fours attached with the little neighborhood parks, 
this guy's even talking about a clubhouse, so we'll see how this shakes out. So, but, um, so that one is moving forward. Those are the stumbling blocks. High cost of construction, tough site, and, um, but um, I, I'm feeling positive about the latest guy. You know, it could be...